Shall we get Isaiah 7? Let's do it. Isaiah chapter 7. The first six chapters of Isaiah were very meaty. In fact, we spent five weeks just in the first two chapters, just trying to get our, our feet underneath us. And then uh, the remaining three or four chapters, uh, we, we swallowed up all in one week uh, per piece. And, uh, but every week, there was just meaty information in there. And uh, that's because very popular passages are in those. And we, we won't fail to see popular passages in chapter 7. But the subject has changed. A, a little bit, and we'll see that. The first six chapters of Isaiah was a preface to the entire book. It was detailing the indictment of Israel and Jerusalem and how they're, where they're at dispensationally as far as in God's covenant program with Israel. They're at, they're at that end of that covenant uh, cur uh, line of curses there where God was about to pour out that final curse of taking them out of the land, you know, that sort of thing. It's how severe it was. And uh, we saw how God was going to do that, and he started to reveal some details about that, how he'd re remove the men, and you know, he'd, he'd humble the women. And, and then in chapter 4, he talked about the fires of purging and how what remained from Israel. Thing. In chapter 5, he talked about that vineyard and the reason why, and how that vineyard God planted but didn't bear fruit. In Isaiah 6, we have Isaiah confronted with the Lord uh, in his temple, and uh, he's called to go to uh, Israel and preach blindness to them, to, to blind them. And to cause them to be deaf to not hear the words of God. And so this is that condemnation. So that's the preface of the book. This is the motivation for Isaiah's whole life ministries, those first six chapters. Isaiah 7 begins a new section. The next six chapters, 7 through 12, I will form a unit, which instead of talking about the, the fall of, the, of Israel, as the first six chapters did, the fall of Israel, and it gives some glimmers of hope about the rise of the city. Remember we talked about the day of the, the kingdom in Isaiah 2. And it had some glimmers of hope of a remnant through there. Isaiah 7 through 12 talks about the fall of a king and the rise of a king. Some people call this section the book of Emmanuel, where we'll see more prophecies in this section about uh, the Messiah, Emmanuel, Christ, a Savior coming. Uh, but before that, you see in this section the fall of the kings of Judah and Israel. And so in this chapter specifically, Isaiah talks to Ahaz, one of the wicked kings of, of Judah, and he, he deals with the wicked king of Pekah and the king of Israel there. And talks about how these kings have fallen. They're just wicked kings. And uh, these prophecies then about them and things that will happen to them or signs given to them that they refuse uh, are really a reflection or a foreshadowing of this coming future king that will be great. You see that will replace these wicked kings. And so that's this section here. And so the fall of a king, the rise of a king is what this section's uh, about. Uh, on your outline there at the very top, the second line, a... A, a brief and maybe oversimplified uh, summary of, the, of these chapters. And hopefully you'll see an interesting, since I've oversimplified it here, an interesting foreshadowing. You've heard talk about the future tribulation and the Antichrist and the future kingdom, and that's all in your head. And, and one reason we're studying Isaiah is so that we know where those ideas came from. Uh, Christians, especially dispensational Christians, have this idea of the future end time events in, in some way, and yet they think that it's just laid out that way in the New Testament, and that's the only place that it's at. And the New Testament does reveal things about that, but really the origin and foundation of that, that timeline came from the Old Testament prophets, and we see that here specifically with Isaiah. Chapter 7 talks about signs being given. 7 and 8, we'll talk about these signs being given and how they're rejected by Israel and Judah, right? Now, is there anywhere else in the New Testament where signs are given to Israel and Judah and they're rejected? Yes, right? And then in chapter 8, it talks about the stumbling and this remnant. So these signs are given and they refuse. Israel's going to stumble and yet there's this remnant that remains. Does that happen anywhere in the New Testament? Yes. You see, so th these, th these events in the Old Testament are prophesied, and that's what's describing what happens in the New Testament with Israel. Chapter 9 talks about the fall of Judah and the fall of Israel. So specifically, the northern tribes are wiped out. And uh, Judah is you know, taken down to a bare minimum. It's just the fall of this God's people. So again, we see this also in our dispensational charts. We have Jesus came, performed the signs. We see they're rejecting Jesus. They stumbled at the cross and they fell in the early Acts period. Uh, chapter 10 talks specifically about the Assyrian. Uh, it doesn't use the word Antichrist, but that's what the Assyrian is. Uh, this concept of the Antichrist and Christ are two parallel and prominent themes throughout all of prophecy. 
you, you've heard how many hundreds of prophecies there are about the Messiah, about the coming Christ. And Israel is looking forward to that. And you'll see some of those tonight in Isaiah 7. Uh, but parallel to that throughout the Old Testament is this, this Assyrian or this rod of, of evil or this, this wickedness that parallels that. It's this anti-king, this anti-Christ. And so that, that the word anti-Christ shows up in the New Testament uniquely. But this idea of, of what that is and who that is goes all the way back to prophecy. So again, this is not a new concept, which hopefully on that topic, as a subnote, uh, puts in your mind that if you're looking for the Antichrist today, you are performing a task that those in prophecy were told to do, nothing concerning the mystery. Do you understand? So we're putting that in its place. And then in chapter 11, it's all about the rise of that Messiah, the rise of Christ, and uh, his establishing his order and justice. And chapter 12 wraps up with the glories, the song of the kingdom promised to Zion. And so you see there this, this flow. There's the signs rejected. There's the stumbling of his people. There's the fall. There's the coming of this false king. Then there's this rise of the true king. And then there's his kingdom. And you're going, wow, that sounds like future events from what we've always known from the New Testament. And yes, that's correct. Because these are the foundation stones of those ideas. Of course, there's more to, than those simplified themes in these chapters. But that, that's a, a neat, I thought, a neat purview of this section. The fall of a king or the, the wicked kings and the rise of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. Now, of course, more detail about those New Testament or future covenant events will be in the second section of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66. But we see them introduced here in these six chapters. Okay, so let's start in Isaiah chapter 7. It came to pass in the days of Ahaz. Now, this is an interesting beginning because the last six chapters have not really been historical. Remember, we we're going through each chapter dealing with some sort of a problem God has with Israel or some future prophecy. Um, but here, it's history. So remember when we were introducing the book of Isaiah, we talked about how many different forms of writing there were uh, in this prophetic book. And this is one of them. It's going to talk here a lot of the chapters about the history of Isaiah's conversation with Ahaz. Uh, you know, so we have to know a little bit of that history. Um, it says, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, already were falling asleep. We're going, who are these people? Well, see, this is why you have to go back and read First and Second Kings and read Second Chronicles. Now, we've, we've studied history of the time period back in our introduction, but just as a review, if you remember, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, it talks about when Isaiah prophesied during the days of King Uzziah, remember? And who was after Uzziah? Jotham. Then, and then who's after Jotham? Ahaz. Then who's after Ahaz? We have the famous king Hezekiah. And so that was Isaiah 1.1. This was Isaiah's ministry during those kings' time period. And these are the kings of Judah, or the southern tribes. And Judah was where Jerusalem was at, you know, where the city of Zion, the city of David was at. And so you have, in contrary to, to Judah, in contrast to that, Israel. And that's going to be the, the, the northern tribes. Right, in the land of Israel. And in Israel, during the time here, it's talking about, notice the verse, it says, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, right? Uh, so it's just going through that genealogy, they're reminding us of that, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, or Melia, the king of Israel. During this time here, Pekah is a king of Israel. Now, Rezin is the king of Syria. Syria has nothing to do with Israel. Syria is a Gentile nation, right? But the player here, Rezin, is going to be important. So we'll just put him on the board up here. Rezin, okay, over Syria. So this is giving us some context here. Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem uh, to war against it. So what's happening here is this wicked king of Israel, Pekah, is conspiring with this Gentile king resident with Syria, and they're working together to come against Judah. Now, do you see a problem with this? Uh, apart from the fact that they're going against God's people, the, the bigger problem here is that, aren't these guys God's people? Yeah. So not only is God's people split ever since Solomon in the days of Jeroboam, but now half of God's people is now confederate with Gentiles against Jerusalem. This is a mess, right? And of course, this is where we're at in Israel's history. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 15, just to read a little bit about the context here. 2 Kings chapter 15.
Even though the Bible is a big book, a lot of the Old Testament actually overlaps with itself. And so uh, first, uh, the Chronicles and the Kings overlap quite a bit, and the Prophets overlap with that. And so there's not a lot of history to learn. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a bit, but it's not too much where you can actually just learn the history, and it will help you greatly with the events happening in prophecy or happening in, even in other smaller books of the Bible. 2 Kings 15, verse 25. What it says here. Pekah, the son of Remalia. Now, keep that phrase in mind, the son of Remalia. We'll, we'll put him up here. Remalia. Now, Remalia was not a king, but uh, we'll see what's happening here. Son of Remalia. Pekah, the son of Remalia, a captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house. Now, it's talking here about Azariah, back in verse 23 and 24. The king, who was actually uh, Azariah, I believe. The, yeah, that's right. So Azariah is the king, uh, and Azariah was killed by Pekah, right, in order to become the king of Israel. Now, what do you know about the northern tribes of Israel? How did they get a line of kings? It wasn't because God said, all right, we're going to have two lines of kings here. No, going back to Solomon, remember, Solomon was the king and from the house of David, and after Solomon, his son Jeroboam, or Rehoboam, and then Jeroboam split the nation, so that there was a line from Jeroboam and a line from Solomon's from through Rehoboam, right? And so these kings here were not ordained of God originally, right? And you see throughout their history, there's not a single one that seems to give any sort of credence to the God of, of Moses, you know, as far as the, what he told them to do. Um, you'll see a spattering in Judah, but it's, it's not much better. And so Azariah was a king, and all the time you'll see kings murder other kings, just try to take over the political power, and that's what you see with Pekah. So he begins his reign as a murderer, right? Not good, not good, right? And so this is verse 25. He, it says, he conspired against Azariah and smote him in Samaria in the play, palace of the king's house. By the way, it's activities like this that happen in Samaria's history that gives rise to the idea in the New Testament when the Pharisees and other Jews were talking about Samaritans in a lower light. And it gives you some context when Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? And he said, the Samaritans. They're going, What? What? I mean, look at this, right? So, they, yes, they were all part of God's people, but the distance here between their history and the wicked acts that were performed, I mean, we don't want anything to do with that, right? And so you see the, the, the nature of Jesus' response there. Uh, you know, the good Samaritan even, when he said there's a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan? <laughs> that's, un, that's unheard of, but Jesus was talking about a good Samaritan. 2 Kings 15, 20, 25. In the palace of the king's house with Aragab and Ariah, and with him 50 men of the Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his room. And it says you can read the rest of these acts in the book of the Chronicles. Turn on to verse 28. And he, that's Pekah, Pekah did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took these, these towns here, Ion and Abel, Beth Makkah and Jonah and Kadesh and Hazor and Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. Do you see Galilee on the list? Galilee was part of the northern tribes. Galilee was part of the northern tribes. Now, you know the name Galilee because Jesus was there. So, again, you have this concept when Jesus was ministering in Jerusalem, they say, what good comes out of Galilee? Right? Because of this. Right? In Isaiah's prophecies, and in the kings, and the history, this was the house of David. This was not. They did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? Uh, over and over again. Of course, we're, we're reading also that the house of uh, Judah is not much better. Look at verse 30. It says, And Hosea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, and smote him and slew him. So even Pekah's successor, right? Is having these thoughts of, of murder and conspiracy. And reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham. So, Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter, you know, let's go to 2 Kings 16. Just turn the page there. 2 Kings 16. It says, In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. So sometimes people get confused when reading the Kings and Chronicles because they're talking about multiple kings reigning at the same time. And that's because, again, there's two, two houses making up the nation of Israel. And so while Pekah was reigning, and this is the context of Isaiah 7, it says Ahaz became to reign. See, so in Judah, Ahaz becomes the king, while Pekah is king in Israel. And so it says in verse 2, 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. 20 years old isn't too old to be a king, is it? I mean, it's not, it's not that experienced. But anyway, 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. 
and did not that which in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. So even though he's in the city of David and the house of David, reigning over the house of Judah, um, he's not doing right either. Not a good not, not a good couple here we have, Ahaz and Pekah. It's not going to be good. Okay. Verse 3, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. Uh, then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remelia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz. Now, that's what we read precisely in Isaiah 7, verse 1, right? We have Ahaz, we have Pekah, and Pekah with resin came up against Ahaz in Jerusalem. And nobody's doing right. This guy's a pagan Gentile. This guy's not doing right. This guy's not doing right. You see? Uh, and yet God, we'll see in Isaiah 7, is actually offering help to Ahaz. And why is that? Because these people are going to get destroyed. Israel's going to be destroyed. But there will be a remnant left of these people. And so, he's, he, so he sends prophets to them. He sends prophets to those guys too, by the way. But we'll, you, can, you can read more about that, how they just reject them. And so it says they send war, or they, they're, they're coming up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. You see verse 5 there? They could not overcome Ahaz. And that, you will, you will see, is, is because of God. This is not um, a, a resume item for Ahaz. This is not a glory to him. It's because God wanted to preserve these people longer than these people. Okay, because of his covenants and his promises, and because of the acts of some of the more righteous kings. We'll see in the days of Hezekiah, they come close to being obliterated. Because of Hezekiah's faithful choices, they get delivered. Right? And we see the same thing happen briefly with Isaiah and even Jotham. So Ahaz is an, is an exception to that. Let's go back to, well, let's read verse 6. At that, at that time, Rezin, at, when they came to war against Jerusalem, they could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria and drove the Jews from Elath. Elath is a place in, uh, in uh, Israel there, northern Israel. And the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there unto this day. So we see here the Syrians starting to live in the land of the northern tribes of Israel. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. So here's another character. Now, Syria where Rezin is king, right? And Assyria are different. Syria was a small country just north of Israel. If I can draw you a crude map here, we're going to draw the Mediterranean Ocean here, and we're going to draw the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea here. And we have uh, Jerusalem is going to be right here, right? Uh, and then you have up here Galilee and all that. So you can just generally, this is very crude, you have the southern tribes and you have the northern tribes. And this is Israel with the, the tribes on the east. So you have the southern tribes with Jerusalem and the northern tribes up here. Syria was a country up here. Even to this day, that's where it's at. right? And you have Assyria, which was an empire that covered all, all this area here. This, this was Assyria. All of this. Right? Huge empire. right? Now Assyria was going to conquer these guys and had its sights on Israel as well. Both They didn't care about the division. Right? And so Syria and the king of the northern tribes conspire to take over the southern tribes so they can get more people on their side to fight against the giant empire of Assyria. Right? Ahaz, who's part of the southern tribes, he's the king of the southern tribes, says in his mind, now I'm, this is all Justin's paraphrase here, right? He says in his mind, well, I'm not going to be driven out by these folks, so I'm going to become confederate with the Assyrians to help, you know, and they're going to help me drive these guys out. Now, what's wrong with that? He's doing the same thing Pekah was doing. He's joining with Gentiles to drive out his brothers in the northern tribes. Right? I mean, there's a big problem on both sides here. But that's what he's intending to do. Second Kings 16. When Ahaz heard and, and uh, the northern tribes in, in Rezin came down and actually took some of these towns over here, Ahaz says, I'm going to get some Assyrians to help me and drive those guys back. He sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Excuse me? I'm your servant and your son? I thought he was of the house of David, and these are the children of God, Jehovah. No, he's the servant of the Assyrians, apparently, now. And, and they said, come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Assyria. See the problem with that statement? Come up and save me? Who's the savior of Israel? The Lord Jehovah God Almighty, right? Who's Tiglath-Pileser? 
Well, a giant ruler of an empire, sure. But also at the scripture you read about the power of Jehovah God. Why isn't he turning to him? And this is going to be the issue in Isaiah 7. And so he says, Save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And Ahaz, and this is, this is the depths of his wickedness here, Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord in the temple and in the treasure of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. So he took the things that God told him to make in his holy temple, took them out and sent them to tiglath pileser in the Assyrian Empire as a gift to help him fight against the northern tribes. You see the problem here. When you read about God destroying people in the Bible, he's not doing it because he's capricious. There is a long laundry list of reasons, and he's laid them out, right? And just talking about this Jerry Springer drama is like, this needs to stop, right? And God's the one that does it. I mean, if you read, you, we go back and read the Old Testament kind of romantically. We read the Psalms like, oh, yeah, the God of Israel, he's almighty. And read the Exodus, oh, yes, all the power. But you're reading that as someone who believes, you see. That wasn't the case throughout Israel's history. Constantly, just like our country, you know, would, would have many times generations of faithlessness, right? And even within the Christian church today, people don't often trust what God has said or even know what God has said. So uh, reading the prophets really brings that stuff out, you know, because the prophets all about condemning the sins of, of the people and giving them the reasons why God's going to punish them. So anyway, we're back here in 2 Kings 16, and verse 8, he took the silver and gold out and gave it to Tiglath the Pileser. In verse 19, and the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria up here. And so he went up to Damascus and took it and carried the people of it captive to Ker and slew Rezin. So we'll, we'll keep that in your mind, that Tiglath the Pileser kills Rezin and those guys. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7. We study that bit of history just to give us some context of when Isaiah is, is when these events are happening. It came to pass in those days that Ahaz uh, uh, was the king of Judah and Pekah and Rezin uh, went up to Jeru towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Okay, even with all the wickedness, God had his hand preserving the city of David for a special reason. Prophecies needed to be given, right? Things needed to happen. So that God could write this book so that a remnant could come back. A remnant needed to be created. People like Jeremiah and the prophecy of the 70 years, right? Daniel ought to be born. I mean, these things had to occur so that his remnant could return. And so his hand was going to preserve these. We'll see in the day of Hezekiah, it's amazing, God's intervention. You say, well, how in the world could this small little country, if you're the political leader of it, this small little country, say anything that they were going to defeat this large empire? I mean, think about in these days. Right? I mean, we, we kind of spoiled in America, one of the largest countries and the largest, you know, military budgets in the world. This small little backwards country with hardly any sort of defense. How is it going to defeat the threat of all of that? Right. That's politically the pressure that's against it. Who would blame Ahaz for taking the political route? Right. How much courage would it take and faith to say, well, my God is going to defeat you. <laughs> right. In the days of Hezekiah, it's exactly what happened. We'll read that in chapters 30, uh, in the 30s there, where in one night, the angel of the Lord showed up and killed hundreds of thousands of people in one night. But you don't predict that, folks. You're not like, well, it could happen. Well, no one knew that, and God just did it. Anyway, it's amazing the things that you can read back here to encourage us to believe God, right? To give us hope. But uh, meanwhile, knowing that God even isn't doing the same things today as he was then, but we still have comfort from the scriptures. Uh, or in Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 2. He cannot prevail against it. Uh, now in verse 2, it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. You understand the people, the players. Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Now I'm going to put Ephraim up here, because it's an alternative name for the people of Israel. Hopefully you um, are helped by some of these connections. Because these names are thrown out there in the Bible, and you're like, that's way too many names. So if you know how they're related, it makes a lot more sense. Israel was a name given to the whole country at one time, and sometimes it's used that way. But when talking about the divided country, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, Israel refers to the northern tribes. And often in the Bible, when talking about the northern tribes, Ephraim is a name that refers to the northern tribes. Ephraim and his land grant was right here on the border between the southern tribes and the northern tribes. And so Ephraim, one of the sons of Joseph, remember, who was given that land grant, it was representative of the northern tribes. 
So they'll say Ephraim this and Ephraim that, uh, and it often refers to just the, the house of Israel, the northern tribes there. Okay. So this is in verse 2 here. They was told the house of David, saying, Syria and Ephraim are confederate. And his heart was moved. Uh, Ahaz was moved, right? The house of David. And the heart of his people, as the trees of wood, are moved with the wind. It's interesting it talks about the house of David there. Because that brings to mind perhaps your remembrance of the covenant God made with that king, David. What was that covenant? The Davidic covenant. Do you remember? It was that God promised a king, uh, it would never cease to be a king from, from the house of David on the throne of Israel. Right? And so you're saying, well, how can that be if they're taken captive? Well, that, what that preservation is, is of the line of David. That the king would be of the son of David. So the son of David would never be removed, you see. It would have to persist. And so here, facing annihilation from their enemies around, right? He speaks to the house, of, he talks to the house of David and how their heart is moved for the fear of what they heard. Okay. And look what it says at the end of this verse. His heart was moved and the heart of the people. Often where the heart of the, the king goes and the heart of the leader goes, the heart of the people goes. And so you have that there. As the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. How do the trees of the wood, uh, wood move? Kind of like the trees in my front yard today, as the wind's blowing so much out there, um, and just blasting around. I've got a mountain ash tree in my front yard, and it's blowing all sorts of petals across my porch. And, and it's just amazing. How do these petals fly that far? Well, you'd have to shake this tree pretty hard, and God made this wind just to shake this tree, and it's moving all like this. And uh, if you remember Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, remember what Paul says about wind not to be tossed to and fro? Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Tossed to and fro by the wind of doctrine. That's all it reminded me of when I read Isaiah 7 verse 2 because it says these people heard this information about what was going to happen and they feared because they didn't have the faith in the Davidic covenant that God had, right? They didn't have this belief and maybe they were childlike. They were children in their belief, right? And so they were not established. We'll see that come up later in the chapter. They were tossed to and fro by this wind as the wood are moved with the wind. So in verse 3 it says, um, that Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirah Jashub thy son. Shirah Jashub, we'll see in chapter 8, means a remnant shall return. Isaiah's children uh, were all signs to Israel. We'll see that in chapter 8 next week. But he takes him and his son, called a remnant shall return, just to try to strengthen the, the faith, if there's any left here at all, in Ahaz, that look, you know, this is the house of David here. God, I mean, David, remember Goliath and all that? David and Goliath, remember the covenant? I mean, house of David. And he's going, I'm afraid of bigger giants. Well, wait a minute. You know, there, there was something God promised that king that you're sitting in the throne of. Ahaz was the son of David, right? Ahaz also was wicked, as we'll see here in a moment. But he says, tell Ahaz in verse 3, um, at the, meet him at the conduit, the upper pool, and the highway, the fuller's field. So it's, it's kind of the secret location here. And say unto him, take heed and be quiet. What's that mean? Be quiet. Because Ahaz was sending messengers to who? The king of Assyria. He, he's looking for help. He's looking for someone to save him. He's sending messengers. He's, he's, be, be quiet. Just don't, don't trust God. <laughs> be still, right? Stop looking for salvation among, with stronger enemies somewhere else, you know. He says, take heed and be quiet. Listen to what I'm telling you, and just be quiet, and fear not, neither be faint-hearted. Right? So this is the message, fear not. He's eventually going to say in the next three verses that because this confederacy, this conspiracy against the house of David is going to fail. That's what he's going to tell him. And so what's the response to this message? Isaiah comes as the prophet of God, and he says, listen to me, son of David, right? Don't be afraid, be quiet. Listen to what I'm telling you. This conspiracy, this confederacy will fail, right? They will not break this house. And the proper response to that message of any righteous man would be faith. You believe what God's telling you, right? This has always been the response uh, to God's word that, that we should have is, is faith. Um, so we see in verse 4, it says, for the, Don't be faint-hearted, don't fear, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, which... I love the King James Bible, folks. There are so many cross-references in here. And that's why it, it, takes, it, it sometimes takes me so long to teach through this stuff. There's so many cross-references uh, that aren't even listed on the outline. You look up firebrands in your Bible, and it's an amazing study about firebrands. 
about how the, the different passages that link to that and how judges back there, Samson was tying firebrands to foxes' tails and everything, and how there were those saved by firebrands in Amos, and it's just a, a neat study. But a firebrand was, you know, a stick, like a torch, right? It had like fire at the end, you know, that sort of thing. And it says here, don't fear for these two tails of these smoking firebrands. Now, the, the bad thing about a flaming torch, uh, th there's a bad side and a good side, right? The bad side is the part with the flame, right? The good side is the part without the flame. <laughs> so if the part with the flame is facing you, that's trouble, right? But what if you're holding the, the tail of it? Well, your hand's not getting burnt, right? You're holding it. But he's saying the two, these two tails of these smoking firebrands. Now, if a firebrand is on fire, that's also dangerous. But if it's just smoking, what's that tell you? The fire is out. So imagine here, instead of a flaming torch, a firebrand, you have a smoking firebrand, and it's just the tail part that you're looking at. What's that mean? It's about to become useless. I mean, the firebrand is no longer a firebrand. There's no fire there. And this is Isaiah. Imagine the, the, the counterintuitive response Isaiah is giving to Ahaz, this, this counter logic, where it, everything he's hearing is that they're about to be destroyed. He's hearing it from Syria and hearing it from Pekah and hearing it from the neighbors and everything else. And here comes Isaiah and says, these two tails of smoking firebrands, they, they got nothing. He said, what do you mean they got nothing? They got an empire across the Mediterranean, right? So it's amazing how we see an example here of Isaiah's boldness, right? And also that he's speaking for God. God knows the future and that's God speaking the truth. This isn't just Isaiah being bold to speak contrary to what the news is saying, you know? Right? People often lo love to do that. The, the news says something, they just love to be counter to it, no matter what it says. Well, that's not what Isaiah is doing here. Isaiah has a word from God, and God is telling him this is the truth, you see. But it is bold, and it is contrary to the, the powers that were. And so, he says, These two tales of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and the Syria, and of the son of Remalia. You see, he mentions Rezin there by name, the king, but he doesn't mention the one who should not be named. <laughs> Pika. In fact, in verse 1 was the last time he mentions Pika. Every other time he shows up in the chapter, it's always the son of Amalia. Right? Now, back then, and maybe even now, there's remnants of it, when you talk to someone, you never mention their name, you always talk about their father. This is an insult, folks. Right? It's because you want to develop a name for yourself, is this idea, right? Well, it's not Pika, it's the son of Amalia. Son of Amalia. What do you mean, son of Amalia? I'm Pika. No, you're son of Amalia. You're worthless. I, I can't even say your name. Right? He'll say it over and over again. In anger of Rezin and the son of Remelia. He was the king of Israel, remember. He was supposed to be the brother, as far as the children of God, the brothers of the house of Judah. See, there's, there's greater insult here that Isaiah is giving to the kings of Israel than even this pagan king. Okay. But anyway, he says, don't, don't fear these two, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remelia, and there it is again, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remelia have taken evil counsel against thee. Don't be afraid, because they've taken counsel, saying... And this is what the, the, the kings are saying. Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Uh, so this was their plan, right? They were going to conspire against him, take it over, set up their own little puppet king there, and then, then they would have control of this place as well and have a bigger army and bigger taxes. So don't be afraid for what they're saying. Uh, in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. So there it is. It's not going to happen. Right? That's it. Where's the evidence, you say? Where's the proof? Tell me, you know, the military strategy that you got going on here. And Isaiah's going, no, this is what God said. He said, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. That's all you need. If God says it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Right? That, that's, that's it. <laughs> In verse 8, moving on. It says, for the head of Syria is Damascus. And uh, the head of Damascus is Rezin. The head there is talking about like the, the authority, right? So Syria is a country. Damascus is the capital city of Syria. And the head of Damascus, who reigns over the capital, the, the authority in, in Damascus, is the king, which is Rezin, right? And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Three score. This is like Abraham language, Abraham Lincoln language, right? Three score. It's 20 is a score. So three score is 60. So you have here 60 and five years, 65 years. Ephraim will be broken, that it be not a people. Look at Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Hosea was a prophet contemporary with Isaiah, also prophesying in the days of Ahaz, in the days of Jotham, rather. Okay? And he's prophesying about the same situation. You know, the wickedness and the fall of Israel and this sort of thing. Remember Hosea 1, 
he's famous for, and we'll see the same context as Isaiah 7, where he has these children. And he names these children as signs for Israel, just like Isaiah. This was the thing, where God used children in their names and used children in, in, as, as signs and wonders to this nation uh, because of multiple reasons, and also interesting study through the scripture. Uh, children point to the future, right? That's what prophets did. They used their children to point to the future, and they did it from God. Uh, but Hosea has multiple children. We'll pick up in verse 6, where he speaks about Israel here. Hosea's wife conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Loruama. And what's that mean? For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. That's where we're at in Isaiah 7. The house of Israel, right here, are so wicked. Pekah was the second to last king. There was one more king after Pekah, and they were gone. Right? I will have no more mercy on the house of Israel. Right? That's what he's saying. Now, verse 7, it says, but I will have mercy upon the house of Judah. You see the situation? House of Judah, they, they were wicked too. I will have no more mercy on Israel, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah. They're going to remain a little bit. These guys aren't. And it says in verse 7, uh, And will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. Now if Hosea says, I will not save you by your army, how is he going to? Some supernatural way, some other way. So for Ahaz, house of Judah, to say, I need to get a bigger army. That's God's way. You know? uh, he knew better. He should have known better. Right? Hosea said, that's not how it's going to happen. In verse 8, now when she had weaned lo Rama, she conceived and bare a son, and then said, God, call his name lo am I, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And he goes on to talk about it will come to pass where it was said, they were not my people, they shall be my people. But verse 9 is the key verse here. Lo am I means you are not my people. Go back to Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7 in verse 8. Three score and five years and 65 years from Isaiah 7 verse 8. Ephraim, house of Israel, shall be broken, that it be not a people. Do you see that? That is Hosea 1 verse 9 being fulfilled in 65 years from Isaiah chapter 7. Now, 65 years, that's a pretty exact number. Many people come to this and say, 65 years, that was just a guess. Like, you know, it'll happen sometime in there, maybe 20, 30, 50, you know, sometime. Actually, you calculate the years of the kings, and calculate when people came and cap took Israel captive, and not just take Israel captive, but when they finally, in 2 Kings 17, took everyone away from the land, 65 years is exactly when that happened. Exactly. How does Isaiah know that? He didn't know it on his own. God spoke it. God told him. Okay. You can go back to 2 Kings 17, 22 and read about how the final people who were living there in Samaria were taken away, and you don't see that nation as a people anymore, ever, right? They're blended with the Gentiles. They're never a country of their own, right? Which is why when Jesus came into Samaria to the well there, and the Samaritan woman at the well, right, he said, you don't know who you worship. Remember that? Uh, they weren't even a nation. They weren't a people. And yet, even in that place, where Jesus was walking through quite often in his ministry, he found people that believed him as the Messiah. John 4 and the Samaritan woman was one of the examples. She believed him. Wow. So what's he do when he goes down to Jerusalem? Jerusalem rejects Jesus, but the received him? That's strange. Right? Stra a strange thing, but also something prophesied. Okay? Anyway, that's Hosea 1 being fulfilled there, or, or spe speaking to that Hosea 1 there in Isaiah 6, verse 8. In verse 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. That guy we're not going to name anymore. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So this is what he says. It will not happen. They're not going to break the house of David, and they're, they're going to be taken away. 65 years, Israel's, the northern tribes aren't going to be there anymore. And thus, they have the whole historical teaching of the lost tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. Many people say that that's, it. that's England now. They moved over to Europe, and so England and Britain and British Israelism is a teaching. Where to this day, there's the stone of scone over there under the throne of the, of, of the, of the king and queens of, of England. And uh, that stone was supposed to be, by legend, the stone upon which Jacob laid his head. And so the, the tribes carried it to England. And now the king and queens of England sit on this stone to fulfill Jacob's prophecy of his people. Nonsense. Superstition, folks. It is not true. Okay, the, the northern tribes of Israel were broken. They're no longer a people. Even if England has remnants of them, which there's no evidence they do, apart from just names of countries that people really manipulate, um, then God is not in it. Okay? And so uh, they're not a people. God will bring them back, but it's not going to bring them back 
in America or in England. That British Israelism really has some, some deep uh, connections with America. If you ever heard of white, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Manifest Destiny and things like that, you know, people thinking that the remnant of Israel now is over in America. Uh, I get comments every now and then from people who think uh, Israel's in Africa. And so the Lost Tribes of Israel are down in Africa. So you have uh, black Hebrews and things like that. And so now you have a, a racial thing happening, whether it's is there white Jews or is black Jews, and who's the true Jews? Maybe there's false Jews somewhere. Um, the Bible says God will bring them back as they're scattered from all the nations of the world. And he knows who they are. We don't have to know who they are because the scripture says they're out of the land. Right. So anyway, go back to Isaiah 7. Where are we at here? In verse 9. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. He said that it will not happen. And he said that uh, 65 years, the northern tribes will be gone. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. The issue here was faith. Right? If Israel, if, if the house of David, the house of Judah, would simply believe God and trust him, be quiet, not fear, not be faint-hearted, trust God, then they will be established. Now what happens if they don't? More like the covenant would say, if they don't, they're going to face repercussions. We'll see some of those later in the chapter. And so he talks about the, the, the purpose of faith here, the instability, the fear, the shaking like the, the, the trees and in, in the wind was a failure to believe what God had promised David, what Isaiah was telling them, reminding them of that promise of David, and what God's telling them now knew that, look, it's not, this specific event's not going to happen. Right? He's telling them specifically, this thing you're afraid of in the headlines back in Isaiah 7 is not going to happen. Right? Um, so, if they would believe, they would be established, otherwise they would be overtaken with fear. Um, if there's a verse you can preach long and hard in the Old Testament about today, in this present circumstances, that might be one of them right there. Uh, what they believed was different than what we believe, right? What they believed is in the previous verses, that this conspiracy and confederacy will not succeed. That's what they were believing. But their faith in what God said, that it would not happen, is what would establish them. Because they're believing and trusting God. Similarly, faith today establishes us. Knowing what God is doing by his grace, and knowing what he has done through Jesus Christ, what he's promised to you in the dispensation of grace in the body of Christ, will establish you through every wind of doctrine and every wind of circumstances. Right? What we believe is different, but the function of faith throughout the scripture is the same, which is to establish you on what God said. What God said has changed. Right? That's dispensational Bible study. So we can go back here in Isaiah 7 and learn about the purpose and the necessity of faith by reading Ahaz, right? Yes. An example of how to comfort and give us hope through times where we may, well, maybe our faith is weak. Well, get strong in faith. Read what God is doing today. Read what God said and all the spiritual blessings you've been promised, right? And establish yourself on what God is doing. You can go back there and read how he, he was faithful back there, what he told them he was doing, right? But we're not believing what Isaiah was, or what Ahaz was supposed to. We're believing something different. Does that make sense? When we talk about different Gospels in the Bible, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about how that, you know, some people aren't sinners, some people are sinners, or Christ only died for some people, not these people. That's not it at all. There's only one way in which God can save humanity, right? But we're talking about Gospels, we're talking about that message, we're talking about that thing that God has delivered for you to believe. And that is definitely different. When I, the Gospel of Isaiah here that he's delivering to Ahaz is, look, what you're afraid of is not going to happen. Believe it. Right? The gospel you and I have been told is that Christ died for our sins. And we're made into a new creature. Believe it and you'll be established. Right? Believe it and you'll be saved even eternally. So you see that difference? I want to point that out because that's a significant phrase there in verse 9. Let's pick it up in verse 10. This next section of the chapter deals with this sign. And this is the most important part of this chapter. The, a sign that God's going to give Judah. Now in verse 10 it says, Moreover the Lord spake unto Ahaz, saying... Now, notice that phrase there. We read right past it because we're reading the Bible and we're not dealing with people personally in front of us. But the verse says, The Lord spake again unto Ahaz. Who's speaking in Isaiah 7? There's two answers that are both right. One, well, it says the Lord's speaking. Yeah, but Isaiah is the guy speaking to Ahaz, isn't he? It's not the Lord who met him by the conduit back there on the fuller's field. It's a is it Isaiah that met him there. That's what a prophet is, folks. A prophet is someone who speaks the words of God, speaks for God. Right? It's so significant to appreciate that because there are no prophets today. We have the words of God printed in a book. And that's just as good as Isaiah because these are the words of Isaiah, the words of God. Right? 
But our prophets actually spoke God's word. So in the Old Testament, instead of Isaiah, it's right to say, the Lord spake unto him, unto Ahaz. Okay? Verse 11, what did he say? Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, either in the depth or in the height above. Now this is an interesting topic that we spent a whole two hours on. We're not going to. Uh, asking God for signs. Fleecing the Lord. That comes from, right? People think they can do this. Now, who is speaking in verse 11? We just covered it. Who is speaking in verse 11? Isaiah, but actually verse 10 says the Lord, which I think is significant here. It doesn't say Isaiah said, ask God for a sign. It's the Lord who said to Ahaz, ask me for a sign. If God tells you to ask him for a sign, you ask him for a sign. If God doesn't tell you to ask him for a sign, then you be quiet. That's the simple response to what about signs like that. So you need to find whether or not God has told you that you should ask him for signs. Because Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Why? Because they weren't given one. Like, except for the ones they were given. There were signs that God gave, and they're asking for another one, is wicked. Right? So the thing that God says, he means. And when he tells him, ask me for a sign, that's what he means. Right? Ask me for a sign. Now, it's interesting, people have speculated here that knowing God, knowing Ahaz as some wicked king, which he was, you know, why would God give Ahaz this privilege? Well, maybe, as in his irony and godly sarcasm, which God is, seems to, to have throughout the scripture, where he, he laughs at people in derision. Uh, perhaps he knows his wickedness, knows his faithlessness, and knowing that people who lack faith are constantly saying, well, if God would just show himself in a sign. You ever heard that? This is not new in the 20th century. It's happened for thousands of years. Maybe knowing that, God says to him, ask for a sign. Do it. I'm letting you do it. Right? The, the response of Ahaz is typical, natural man, typical unbelief. Ask thee for a sign. Now he says, ask for anything you want. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. The depths. I mean, the things that God has done from the depths. He's opened the earth and swallowed men. Right? He has risen people from the dead, called them out of the grave, and brought them back to life. Right? What about the heights, the things God's done in the heights from heaven? He struck down fire from heaven in the days of Elijah, right? He has showed signs in the sun, moon, and stars. He stopped the sun in the days of Joshua. From in the height above to the depth below, ask for a sign, anything you want. Open-ended here, blank check, right? Which made me think when I read that, what would I ask God? Because, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to because he didn't tell me to, but it's like, if I were Ahaz, what would I say? I'm thinking, like. Live 300 years? I don't know. I mean, what would I do? Solomon said, give me wisdom. Remember that? Solomon asked and you'll receive. He gave him wisdom. Jesus said that too. He has not said that to us, folks. We're not told to ask for a sign. We have his words. We're to walk by faith, not by signs. Right? So faith in his word. By his grace. But Isaiah 7, verse 11. Ask me for a sign. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But verse 12, what's it say? Ahaz said, I will not ask. <laughs> the Lord speaking to him, asked for a sign. He said, I will not. Now, what does Ahaz do? Quotes Bible back at God. <sighs> Peter did that once. Remember in Acts chapter 10? The Holy Spirit was speaking in a vision, a dream. But remember the blanket from heaven? He tells Peter, eat. And Peter goes, not so, Lord. Peter did it a couple times, remember? remember Peter, Peter, <laughs> Peter was zealous. Peter always thought God was testing him. You're testing me, aren't you? Because I know that scripture. learned it in Sunday school. Quotes it back at God, and Peter's always wrong. Ahaz says the same thing. Ahaz says, I will not ask for a sign, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now, what makes Ahaz's response different than Peter's was that Peter was doing it from faith. That's a huge difference, folks. People say, well, I'm afraid of messing up in my prayers. They're afraid of messing up, and maybe I'm doing something wrong with God. And people are afraid so much that they're paralyzed and do nothing. Okay, making mistakes, God expects, you understand. It all has to do with faith. Thank God it's not of works, but it's His grace. Because we will and have messed up. But we should strive to do right. The man of faith says, I want to do His will. I want to know His will. I want, to, I want that. And when you mess up, you thank God for His grace. That's what Peter did, right? He messed up. But he kept going. That, guy, that guy's got faith. This guy didn't have faith. It's evident from what he didn't want. He didn't want to do God's will. Never did. And so what he's doing here is really covering up his wicked acts and thoughts by quoting the Bible. And this is typical of unsaved humanity. Wicked men always cover up their deeds by quoting the Bible. Right? Well, judge not. Jesus said, judge not. Take a little wine, Paul said. 
right? You quote all sorts of scriptures to justify lots of sins, right? And wicked men love doing that because they know the Bible has authority, right? I mean, why not just quote your and say, God doesn't exist, you know? <laughs> Curse God and die. That's a Bible quote, right? So this is what Ahaz is doing here. He's, he's playing the hypocrite because even though God says, I'll show you a sign, and he's looking for salvation, looking for help, he doesn't want it from God, even though he claims to be a king of the Lord. So... Anyway, that's what's happening here. In 2 Chronicles 28, verse 22. Look, look back here in 2 Chronicles 28, 22. <clears throat> it says here in the history of Ahaz that in the time of his distress, his distress was his fear about being overtaken, right, by his enemies. In the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. <laughs> Unless you get it confused with another king, it's that one. The one who, even in his distress, even he was driven to turn to God. That's why we have the sentence of death, right? When you face troubles, it should drive you to turn to God in faith. And Ahaz, even in his distress, trans transgressed and trespassed against the Lord even more. This is what we'll read in Isaiah 7. Ask me for a sign, Ahaz, I'll give it to you. Not so. <sighs> Wrong choice. I'll save you. Well, I'm going to Syria over there. He doubled down on his sin, you see. That's the, the, the history there. Let's go back to Isaiah 7. Now, there's someone else who, who quoted the Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. This is Deuteronomy 6, 16 is what Ahaz uh, mentions here. I will not tempt the Lord. Who else said that? Jesus. Remember? Jesus. Um, again, what's the difference between Ahaz and Jesus? Jesus responded, I will not tempt the Lord. It's, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. But what was he being asked to do? Remember? Now, who was asking it? The devil was. Satan was asking it. Remember I said wicked men love to cover up their, their evil deeds with Bible verses? That's the devil in Matthew 4. The devil is evil. And yet he's quoting Bible at Jesus. Right? So see, he's hiding his evil with saying, look, doesn't the scripture say, cast yourself off this temple and you, you, know, you dash your feet against the stone and you'll be saved from the angels. Right? Jesus says, don't tempt the Lord. There is a teaching about Deuteronomy 6 and a teaching from Matthew 4 and a teaching from that what Ahaz said. You know, even in his own faithlessness, there's a teaching from that about not tempting the Lord. Even though God has promised something, you never try to put God to the test or prove him, right? Just because God has said something doesn't mean you try to test that out. And I only say that to take a grace application here, because God has told you it's not of your works. God's told you you're saved no matter what you do, because it's what Christ did, right? He did everything necessary to save you. And sometimes people's response to grace is, well, I'm putting that to the test. Don't. That's wrong. It's not because God's not faithful to do what he said. Because it's wrong to thank the Lord thy God. It's wrong to say, I'm going to prove out that grace. Uh, I'm going to make myself a greater sinner. Right? That's wrong, folks. It's evil. The law is still pointing out what's right and wrong, and they're still right and wrong under grace, even though God has given you grace. Right? So things like that we need to remember. We can learn a lot from the law. Law is holy, just, and good. It's us who are wicked. Right? Again, thank God for his grace. And so you have Isaiah 7 in verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 12 here. Neither will I tempt the Lord. In verse 13, here's Isaiah. He said, Hear ye now, house of David. Is it a small thing for you? See what he calls him here? He calls him the house of David. Harkening back into that promise. He doesn't even call him Ahaz. He, he, this guy is sitting on the throne of David. Hear, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? It's interesting in, in, uh, in verse 11. It says, ask the sign of the Lord thy God. In verse 13, Isaiah says, uh, will you weary my God? Because apparently he's not yours. Right? You won't obey him. Right? That, so that's interesting to notice that change of the word there, thy and my. It's a small thing to weary men. You sin against them, do evil against them, but to disobey God is just, weary him is just a horrible thing. Therefore, verse 14, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. He shall give you a sign. And this is the popular passage. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so you've all heard that before, right? This is strong and significant messianic prophecy that will be more described in future passages in Isaiah. Isaiah 9, verse 6, about a child unto us is born. Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the, the, the root and branch from Jesse. And so what we'll see in prophecy, as I told you at the beginning of our studies in Isaiah, that Prophets lay out these topics, lay out these, these, these hints. And then in later prophecies, they give more detail and more detail to flesh them out. 
And we saw that in Isaiah 1 where he starts talking about how God's going to save Judah and give a remnant. And we see more details as each chapter goes on. And here's another detail. A detail of a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name will be God with us. Now, the idea of God being with Israel and with Judah is something that was promised all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he promised them, he says, I am with you, and I will be with you, and I will be with your house and with, your, with this nation. God promised to be with them. But to know that they would come from the house of David was something that was added to that covenant with David. To know that it would be born of a woman, of a virgin, is something they didn't know. They just thought it would be someone from the house of David. But now, okay, wait a minute, wait, a, a virgin shall conceive? That's significant, right? This is a detail, and we'll see more of that as we, as we go on. Isaiah 9, 6 talks about his name being wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, right? Everlasting father, his name shall be. Well, how many names does this guy have? Good question. <laughs> uh, that's not a normal guy, is it? He's got a lot of names. His name in Isaiah 7, verse 14 is Emmanuel, okay, which we see show up in Matthew 1 as well. Look at Matthew 1, 22. We know this is talking about Jesus because of Matthew 1, 22 and 23. You can know about it from the Old Testament as well, and even Jews who study Isaiah will say it's talking about the Messiah. It's a mess messianic reference, but they just don't believe Jesus was it. But Matthew chapter 1 lays the argument to rest for you in the Bible when it says in Matthew 1, 22, when the angel appeared to Joseph and Mary. In verse 21, he shall bring forth the, she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus meant saving his people. In verse 22, now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Right? So what was the name of this baby boy that Mary con that was conceived in Mary and that was born in the manger? What was the name? Jesus? Emmanuel? Prince of Peace? Wonderful? Right? It's interesting you read this Matthew 1, and we don't know Jesus, at least we don't, we don't say the name often, right? We're not like, oh, it's the Lord Emmanuel Christ. It's, that's not something you've ever heard, I don't think. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to point out here is that this, this guy had names, plural. People go back to Isaiah 7, they try to find someone else whose name was Emmanuel back there in Isaiah's day. Well, you don't have to, folks. There might have been, but you don't have to try to find one, because people have multiple names. Specifically, Jesus has multiple names. You see? And so we'll see that next week as we study more about child, children and their names. But we have Jesus called Jesus in the same passage he's called Emmanuel to fulfill that prophecy in, in Isaiah 7, 14. This is speaking about Jesus. And it's important because it mentions virgin, right? A virgin shall conceive. And we know in the New Testament there that Mary was a virgin, right? And Jesus did not come from Joseph, which is significant because there was a curse on Joseph's line, where there would not be any king come from Joseph's line. And so if Jesus were actually born of the flesh of Joseph, then God himself would have been a liar. You see, that's significant. You go back there in Jeremiah and read more about that. But Jesus came from Mary, who was also in the, the house of David. But women don't have children on their own. That's not how it works. Except for Genesis 3.15, where God promised that the seed of a woman will bruise your head. Talking about the devil, the serpent, right? The seed of a woman? Women don't have seeds. Right? Men have the seeds. Women, you know, have the womb. But you have the seed of the woman. How does that work? Matthew 1 talks about how the Holy Spirit came upon her and conceived in her that holy thing, which was Jesus Christ. Okay, and so you have this virgin birth. The only time in human history this has occurred because God made it so. Not the only time a miraculous birth has ever happened. Or I have to reverse here a bit. It wasn't really a miraculous birth. It was the conception that was miraculous, right? Which speaks a lot to, you know, what life is. But... We have lots of miraculous conceptions. In the Old Testament, you have Sarah who had one, right? Rebecca who had one. Lots of miraculous conceptions. Now, those miraculous conceptions were a different sort of Mary's, which was virgin, fairly virgin. But uh, the virgin birth is an important doctrine to, um, to hold up. And Isaiah 7 is not really talking about the doctrine of the virgin birth, but it is prophesying it. Okay, but you see in the Bible, this doctrine of virgin birth is fundamentally important. And uh, I say that because uh, you know, 100 years ago, and it still exists today, it is a defining doctrine of people whether they believe your Bible or not, or believe Jesus is God or not. If they deny virgin birth, which is scientifically impossible, according to people who's never seen one before, which I haven't and you haven't, and nobody else has ever seen it, right? Um, they deny that means they're going to have to deny the Scripture. 
They're going to have to deny, ultimately, Jesus being the Son of God, and will end up compromising the sinless nature of Jesus. All these are tied to this doctrine. If you think about the, the teaching of the cross, and how he died for your sins, and the first Corinthians 15 says he died for your sins, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. You ever think about why he mentioned that word buried there? Why is the burial important? Can you deny the burial? Can you say, well, he died, and he rose? I mean, the burial, eh, I don't know if he was actually buried. Well, you're at risk to become a Muslim there, who didn't think he actually died in that cross. You see, the burial puts the sentence on the fact that he died. You know, he was buried. You don't bury people who are alive, right? People who are virgin born are not normal humanity. You know, it's not like this is an everyday birth, an everyday conception. This is something special going on. Right? That's of God. But Jesus was fully man because he was born of Mary. He was fully God because he didn't have an earthly father. In Jesus' ministry, multiple times he says, I do the business of my father, right? I and my father are one, right? I do nothing of myself. I do what the father tells me. My father tells me. Well, who's his father? I mean, really, he keeps talking about his father so greatly like that. It's not Joseph, folks, right? So in Luke one twenty two, and other Bible translations change that to say his father and mother. That's incorrect. It's Joseph and his mother. Right? Joseph and his mother. That's what King James says. This doctrine is important to preserve in many times the passages that deal with his being born of a virgin because of the absurdity of it in our modern culture. They, they, skeptics of the Bible tend to retranslate those words. And Isaiah 7, 14 is no exception. In this passage, the word virgin has all sorts of controversies around it. They want to make it some young woman or something. I mean, a virgin, that's someone's, something's, probably someone put there after they wrote Matthew or something, you know. No, it means virgin. It's just fine. I'm not going to get into the depths of Hebrew and Greek, and it doesn't have to, folks. Matthew 122 solves it for you because it quotes it. It says virgin, right? So we know, we know literally that end from the beginning because, it's, because God revealed it that way. So Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul says Jesus was born of a, made of a woman. In Galatians 4, we're made of a woman, right? And so passage after passage of the Bible defends the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 14, Isaiah 7, it says, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Do you see that? He shall give you a sign. Look up at verse 11. God said, ask a sign, uh, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. You see the word thee and thy? That's singular. Okay, in the King James Bible, thee and thy speaking to one person. And the way people talk today in English, we don't know the difference. I can be talking to you or you. And you think, well, you just said the same thing twice. Maybe I was talking just to thee, Steve, or to ye, whole room. Ye means plural, thee means singular. And Isaiah is talking to Ahaz singular when he says, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, singular, your God. And later he says, my God, that's singular, right? But in verse 14 he says, to the house of David, in verse 13, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, the house of David. You see, he's hearkening back to that promise that God said to David, I will have a son of David sit on my throne. He's saying, well, house of David, here are you all. A virgin shall conceive. Right. And this will be the sign. And his name shall be Emmanuel. Now, people may ask, well, how is this a sign to Ahaz? I mean, that's 700 years after Isaiah said it, that Jesus was born, which is an amazing prophecy. But how is that a sign to Ahaz? He's long dead. Well, first response is that Ahaz refused the sign, remember? So maybe it wasn't given to him. It was given to the house of David. So when the faithful remnant of the house of David looked back on, was God going to preserve this Messiah prophecy? Yep. He sure is. A virgin shall conceive. They're looking for that, you see. Also in the Bible, you see many times where God gives signs and the people who give them to, they don't actually see the sign. They don't see what occurred. See what talking about. Like Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, when Moses was questioning whether or not you know, he should go through with this whole delivering Israel from Pharaoh business. And God says, I'll give you a sign. I'll give you a token of, of what I said will happen. Is that when you're done doing this, you will sit on this throne, this mountain with me, and you'll Converse with me, right? You'll be with me on this mountain after you're all done with it. The sign of Moses that God, to Moses that God was saying something true was that when you're done, you'll be back on this mountain with the burning bush and all that, dealing with me. Well, Moses didn't see that until it's all done, right? But what was that supposed to do inside of Moses? Confirm his faith, right? It was supposed to motivate him, right? Here's this promise. This, this, this is the sign that you know. That, that what I say is true when this, this comes to pass. And of course, Moses was the one who got that law on that mountain, right? 
So there are times in the Bible where people don't actually see the thing. And it's still a sign to confirm your faith. It's not one to try to persuade you to believe. Ahaz didn't have faith. God knew that. He asked him for a sign. He refused it, which is a sign of his lack of faith. And then he gives a sign to the house of David. Right? So those who did have faith would be confirmed that they believe God. It's true. Because look, remember that prophecy Isaiah said? Right? In Matthew 1, Joseph and Mary could say, remember what Isaiah said? It's coming to pass. Right? And you had the benefit of hindsight looking back and going, that's amazing. Both historical to you, but you see 700 years apart, God said it 700 years later, he fulfilled it. 700 years later, God doesn't forget his promises, he keeps them. 700 years, that's, just, that's a third of the dispensation of grace, right? God made a promise thousands of years ago to, to Eve, and he was fulfilled thousands of years later. God doesn't forget what he promises and prophesies, right? We learn things from the prophet, things from scripture. These are good. Right, verse 15, Isaiah 7 Talking about this, this son, his name Emmanuel, that conceives butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And again, we have an example of the faithless, the faithless commentators, or, or maybe people are educated outside of belief of their Bible. And passages like this really cause them trouble. They say, how in the world can butter and honey help someone know to refuse the evil and choose the good? Right. So they want to change the verse to say, butter and honey shall he eat till he know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Or maybe when he knows, you know, but that he may know. What's butter and honey have to do with evil and good? Which I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm a simpleton or something. I remember going to a buffet and looking at the dessert section and seeing a giant pile of creamy goodness and getting a big glob and putting it in my mouth and going, ah, it's butter. It wasn't dessert. It was butter. Right. And you say, that's just silly, Justin. Well, maybe that's the case. I mean, butter and honey are both used uh, to eat, and you have to discern one from the other, right? That, that's, a, that's a simple way of reading it. But you also read in the scripture that about butter and honey. Again, another study, the beauty of, of cross-referencing verse, uh, words in your King James Bible. So you learn something about butter and honey. <clears throat> in Job 6, verse 30, Job says, can't my tongue taste perversity? Perversity. Your tongue, the senses you've been given, were actually given to you to, to picture your spiritual discernment. And when you are able with your tongue to discern things bitter and sweet, right? That is actually just a picture of you spiritually being able to discern things that are tasty and not. I mean, are doctrines tasty? Is the word of God good tasting? The Bible talks like that, doesn't it? 1 Peter 2, verse 3, it says, If you taste of the Lord's grace, then see that it's good. Taste of the, of the man is lived by bread alone, but every word that proceeds in the mouth of God. Can you eat the words of God? Isaiah did, right? Or no, Jeremiah did. John did, excuse me. John ate the book in Revelation. That's right. But you can apparently taste things. And so that, that metaphor there, that comparison. And so this butter and honey has to do with that. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. This is a fun little go through of Proverbs referring to honey. Remember, Israel has promised the land of milk and honey. Put a little muscle behind your milk and you get butter. In Proverbs chapter 24, in verse 13. Verse 24, verse 13. My son, <clears throat> here we go. Here's the wisdom to sons. We got any sons in here? My son, eat thou honey. There you go. Take it home. And your parents, my son, eat thou honey because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. You said, there's no other reason to have to eat honey than right there. I want some honey. Why? It's good. And that's what Proverbs 24 says. It's good to your taste. How do you know it's good? You've tasted it. And your tongue can interpret this. Right? Proverbs 24. Now look at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. Hast thou found honey? Yeah, I was eating. It was good. Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit. Well, that's wise, I guess. I found some honey, I'm going to eat it, it's good, not so much, you're going to throw up, right? Okay, so I have to discern a time in which there's too much of a good thing, right? And it comes bad. You see how this is happening here? Do you think God's actually telling people how much honey to eat? All right, guys, one cup of honey, that's it. Okay, one tablespoon of honey, that's it. Now, he's using language that you are familiar with to communicate spiritual principles with us, right? Look at Proverbs 25, verse 27. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. Now he makes that direct comparison there. It's not good to eat too much honey, just like it's not good for you to seek too much glory. Hmm, okay, now I'm getting the picture. It's not about honey. It's about something else. Right. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and 14. Hebrews 5. 
I tell you what, these commentators are funny. I, I read them, and so many of them are talking about going, what does that have to do anything with good and evil? I'm like, have you studied the scripture? I mean, really? I mean, in the Bible, the Spirit bears fruit, right? In the Bible, we eat the words like bread. In Hebrews chapter 5, Sometimes you get so stuck in translating a word and you want to translate it something to make sense to you that you forget to actually study the word to see what it makes sense to God. Hebrews chapter 5. I'll get there. Verse 12. When of the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk. Well, there you go. The exhortation of Hebrews 5 verse 12 is to buy some skim or whole and give it to these people and drink it. No. What's milk talking about? You give babies milk, right? You don't give babies a tub of butter. You don't do it. Babies can't make butter, right? I mean, milk, you just pour in a cup and they drink it. You, you know, you hand it to the bottle or they, they drink it from mom or something. But butter takes some churning, right? So you leave a baby or some child out there to eat on their own, give them a cup of milk, that's fine. Butter takes some work. You ever tried to harvest honey? It takes some work, folks. It takes some work to get that stuff. But Hebrews 5, verse 12 says, you need a milk. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, newborn babes drink milk. He says in verse 5, and not of strong meat. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. <sighs> Hopefully you had a light bulb just turn on there. Because Isaiah 7 says, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may be able to Use the good and refuse the evil. Butter and honey. Hebrews 5, 12, 14 says the same thing. Your senses being exercised to discern good and evil. Being ready to eat strong meat. Right? Newborn baby, you're getting butter and honey, right? Ain't doing it. They've got to be of an age they can discern things. An age they can eat things. An age they can know good and evil. They can discern these things. The, the point of the prophecy in Isaiah 7 is simply that this son that would be born by this virgin um, will not be will not reach the age where he can discern good and evil before, and this is where we're going to read the next part of the prophecy, before these kings will be destroyed. That's the prophecy. How long does it take for a child to be able to eat some butter and honey and discern good and evil? My son's around that age right now. I can tell. He's beginning to discern good and evil. He knows good and evil. And he knows because my hand starts swatting when he does the evil. And he knows what good looks like because I'm training him. And it's like he's about two and three years old. It doesn't take very long for these kids to start to know what good and evil is. But there's a time when they're really, really young and they just don't know. I mean, they're just ignorant. You can try discipline, they don't do nothing. They get to an age where you're like, all right. And it's not very old. That's what Isaiah is saying, Isaiah 7, verse 14 and 15. A virgin shall conceive, takes nine months for the baby to be born, and then it takes, you know, a year or two for the, the kids to actually start to learn to certain uh, evil, uh, good and evil. And before that time, verse 16 says, Before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. That's the sign. So, I mean, wait it out. Two or three years. Just be still, be quiet, trust God for two or three years, and you'll see all this is for nothing. Right? What Ahaz do? Immediately. Calls king of Assyria. Right? Couldn't even wait a couple of years. Couldn't even wait a couple of years for God. Calls king of Assyria. And there's going to be a problem because of that. Now he gets delivered from those kings because Tiglath-Pileser did kill Rezin. And did kill Pekah and, and solved his problem immediately. But what happened as a result of that is Ahaz took those treasures and gave it to Tiglath-Pileser. And Tiglath-Pileser hired some Babylonians to come and help him with the job. Right? And the Babylonians saw the treasures that came from the temple of, the, of, of Jerusalem. And those Babylonians took word back to their king that there's some riches over there. What do you think those Babylonians did? They came back and got the rest of them. They destroyed Judah and Jerusalem. You should have trusted God. Right? Problem. Ahaz didn't live to see the Babylonian kings come and conquer Judah. But things were set in motion by Isaiah 7 when Ahaz refused to trust what God said. You see? Wow. Amazing connections here in Isaiah 7, verse 17. The rest of the chapter, we'll finish up here real quick. The rest of the chapter deals with this condemnation of Judah, this condemnation of Israel, because of Ahaz's lack of faith, because of their fear and lack of faith. Remember, he says to you all, if you believe, you'll be established. And they, they were following Ahaz in their lack of faith. Right? Ah Isaiah was part of a remnant, folks, part of a small group of people that believed. Many of the prophets in Israel and Judah were faithless, were false prophets. Isaiah, Hosea, these were part of this remnant group. Jeremiah became part of that. 
He says in verse 17, The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people, talking about Ahaz here, upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah and the king of Assyria. Remember when the nation was split? Remember that when we lost 10 out of the 12 tribes? Remember that? Bad day, right? He says their days come, it's going to be worse than that. You'll lose more than 10 tribes. You'll lose your land. You'll lose being called a nation of people. Right? You'll lose more than that, is what he says. And he says, even the days that have not come from the day of Ephraim departed from Judah. And what's he talking about? Even the king of Assyria. So we get introduced here to this thought of this king of Assyria that's going to come and cut down Judah. In, in chapters prior, I talked about how God will remove the men from Jerusalem, remember? And the humbled. He talked about how he'd come and purge the city. And knowing the end from the beginning, we put pieces together, but think through the way he revealed it. He hadn't said who that would be and how that would happen. In Isaiah 7 now, for the first time, he's identifying nations that will come and cut down Jerusalem. Is that king of Assyria is going to bring days upon you, even though you hired him to do your job, he's going to bring days upon this city that's never been seen since the days that Israel was split in two. Okay. And so you see in verse 18, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Two nations named by name. He says, the Egyptians and the Assyrians will be part of your downfall. Now again, see, this is how prophecy in the Bible works. Prophecy in the Bible is not as vague as Nostradamus and other such so-called prophets. The Bible in the prophecy is very specific. 65 years. Egypt and Assyria will be part of the downfall. Right? That king of Assyria you hired will come back to bite you. Right? That's what he said, very specifically. And it happens just like that. Now, you have to appreciate this. this is, he's talking about things that happen after Ahaz is dead. After Isaiah is dead. You understand? So it's not like Isaiah or God just looking at the headlines and interpreting the events. And, uh, he's talking about things that happen next generation. And names the countries. And names those empires that would fall and the countries that will not exist in 65 days and those that are going to come to destroy you. And how they're going to do it, specifically. He says in verse uh, uh, 19, They shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns, upon all bushes. And in the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired. So this is getting at Ahaz's plan here. You're hiring king of Assyria with my riches, right? And he says, this razor, he calls him a razor, like a razor blade, shave razor, right? He, this hired razor, um, it says, namely, by them beyond the river. So he's not, he doesn't leave it with the metaphor. He gives it a name. These, the king of Assyria, the king of Assyria that you hired will be my razor, the tool in God's hand, okay, that he will shave the head and the hair of the feet and shall consume the beard of Judah. Cutting beards off in Judah was a shameful thing. Okay, you read back there in David's day when he had his beard cut off for other people who shaved their beards off. Even in the military today, you see shaving of heads and faces being a sign of service and submission. First thing you do in the other armies, they cut off your beard and cut off your long hair. Boom. Why? I like my beard long hair. Not in the army. You know, not in the military. It's a sign of submission. Everyone's going to have it like this. To grow out your beard is a sign of freedom. One of the things people do when they get out of the military is they grow their hair out. Why? It's not under the rule anymore, you know. Well, Judah would be shaved down, cut down by the razor that was hired, namely king of Assyria. Whoops. Bad choice Ahaz, right? And so you can read about baldness and all this, the study, and it's an interesting study about baldness as well and how it has to do with Israel's destruction. But this is what's going on here. He names the tool he's going to use. Isaiah chapter 10 will talk about the rod of the Assyrian, his rod of his anger. And down in verse uh, 21, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep, talking about the people in the land of Judah there. There's going to pass that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. Now that's, you see, that's not bad. I don't have any cows or any sheep. <laughs> yeah, when you're, you're talking about either flocks or you're talking about having vineyards and fields. Remember Isaiah 5 was all about vineyards. Okay. Ha having agriculture and vines and olive oil and trees was more sophisticated than having animals walk around and milking them. Right? That was just a thing, right? Or sharing the sheep. And so you'd see a sign of a lower class of food was food that you'd have to hunt, right? The higher class was food you would have to cultivate and grow and bear fruit. 
You see this as far back as Abel. Abel brought what he hunted, right? Cain brought what he grew. And everyone knows God didn't have favor on Cain's fruit. But you see, that was contrary to nature, and that Cain spent probably a lot more time on those vegetables than Abel did on his animals, which God made anyway. He just shot down, right? But see, the, the principle there is that the glory of man isn't what God wants. It's what God provides that he wants, right? Uh, anyway, the, the sign there of it being a, a kind of a lower class of food is this idea. He has one cow and two sheep. There's going to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give. The abundance of milk it could be either because there's not enough uh, children of cows to, for them to nurse their milk away or that there's not enough people to drink the milk. That's the issue here. There's so few people, right? And there's, there's so few, um, it, it's just an abundance of milk that they shall, give, they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. That's that remnant there. There's another reference to that butter and honey. And discern the good and the evil. It shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines. So they, there used to be vineyards. A thousand siverlings, that's how much it costs for these thousand vines. It shall even be for briars and thorns. Instead of the vineyards, briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come there, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. Why would they come there with bows and arrows? Because when people cultivate lands, they cut down trees in the forest, you know, the, the wild animals go away. Right? What we saw with the shutdowns and lockdowns just a few weeks ago. They started, you see the pictures of the, the wild animals in cities? Do you, you see that? They're like, wild animals roaming around New York City or wherever because they shut down the cities and no one was there. The wild animals start coming back. And this is what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7. It's like, you're going to be destroyed. The people are going to be gone and you won't have any fields to cultivate. No farmers are out doing their thing all the time. And so it's going to grow up briars and thorns, you know, the bushes again and the wildflowers. And these animals start walking around, you know, bears and whatnot, lions. So you better take your bow and arrow. Because I'm going over to what used to be the field, but now it's like, who knows what's out there, right? That's what's going. They're taking their bow and arrow. And in verse 25, and on all hills that shall be did with a mattock. A mattock is not an archaic word. Mattocks are used even today by uh, farmers and such. It is not a hoe, which is what they put in other Bibles. A, a hoe is a tool like this, right? A mattock is a tool like this. Different pictures. Right? Look them up on Google. They're still in existence today. But the hills that were digged with a mattock, there shall not come there the fear of briars and thorns, um, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and the treading of lesser cattle. And so you would dig a, the, the, the thorns and briars out with your mattock. But uh, that's what they were doing. But now instead it's just grazing land because there are enough people. There's not enough resources to actually have these hills plowed down. So this is the response to Isaiah, Ahaz's faithless rejection of God's sign. Uh, and remember, it's talking about the people that are left here in Judah. There's always this remnant. Those people left. We saw it in Isaiah 1, 9, which says, left, unless there was a remnant, we'd be like Sodom. We saw it in Isaiah 3, there's going to be a people left in the land. Isaiah 4, that which was left after the fire. Isaiah 6, 13, remember? A tenth will return. Turn. Isaiah 7, the same thing. They're going to be destroyed, but they're going to come back. We'll see in chapter 8, then, more about these signs in Isaiah's children. Any comments or questions? Yes, sir. about how um, we, don't, we don't have to know who the remnant is today. And you were talking about people have these false ideas of where Israel is at, you know, like maybe the British. Oh, the 10 people. tribes and stuff, yeah. Okay. And, and you had made the comment that we don't have to know who the remnant is today. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to clarify that you weren't saying that the remnant exists today. No. You were, yeah. say, you were saying that, uh, that people try to identify it, and that is not needed because God will bring them back. That's but right. in the way that it was said, it almost sounded like one could, I mean, like the remnant is out there. We I see. Just, yeah. just don't have to know. It's not our job. And also, yeah, the, the God's remnant of Israel, according to their covenant, doesn't exist. They died out with Peter. And um, you say, well, if they're gone, then they're gone, right? Well, no, because God can have these stones resurrect people to be his people. And you'll see that in Ezekiel and you'll see that in Revelation. Um, people will return, and also the, there are angels preaching there. People will start to believe again. Uh, the, the remnant is specific terminology referring to the, the covenant Israel that are obedient to that covenant. That's who that is. And they, they've existed throughout Israel's history. There's always this faithful few in Israel that did do what God said. Right? Um, today, God is not telling us to do what he told them to do under the covenant, so therefore there is no remnant today. Right? Jews today who are faithful must be faithful to the gospel of the grace of God like you and me, and they're part of the body of Christ. So yeah, thank you for that clarification. So, any other comments? All right.
Hope you enjoyed that. Let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your miraculous intervention and signs throughout history. And we thank you for your word that's preserved them for us to study and read and know about. We thank you for your involvement throughout history, knowing that because of uh, your involvement with Israel, because of things that the scripture describes, nations have been changed and the course of history has been altered in many places. And we thank you that you are a God that has all power and that humanity never reaches and attains the glory that you provide through your word and your grace. And we thank you for your spiritual blessings today and the things that uh, we understand according to your manifold wisdom that are far more excellent than what anyone knew before, and yet we don't deserve to know it. So we thank you and appreciate it, and we pray that we be stewards of those mysteries so that we may do your will to your glory. Amen.